Awareness of Dracula's vampire origins leads to the next vital question, his motives. He is no zombie-like automaton, driven solely by an unthinking lust for blood, as fo a folklore tends to represent its vampires. The relationship between Dracula and blood is much more subtle. For one thing, its consumption can actually change his appearance. His countenance undergoes a rapid transformation according to the frequency of his blood intake. Absorption of blood enables him to change from an old man into a younger, stronger man with dark, not white hair. In as short a space as three days between meals, his hair would revert to showing white streaks. Dracula is not desperate to drink every drop of blood that comes his way. He does not patrol nightly in search of liquid nourishment in order to keep alive. Rather, his is the addiction of the junkie or the alcoholic. Dracula will not die if no blood is available any more than will the alcoholic if deprived of spirits. It is more accurate to say that in both cases only a single substance can supply that extra vigour, that pepped up fuel. It is not that Dracula likes drinking blood. He needs blood. He does not need it for life, which he is blessed, cursed with anyway, but for power. It functions as a stimulant. The only e exception to this function is when he, his taking of blood performs a tactical purpose. Dracula's blood banks are always female. female. His gypsy henchmen, for example, who do his earthly bidding, do not go in fear of his teeth. Renfield similarly becomes a servant of Dracula, not his blood supply. Still more illuminating is Dracula's ultimately trivial interest in Jonathan Harker, who is his passport to Britain and his Eng English language tutor, not his provider of nourishment. When Harker cuts himself shaving, Dracula only momentarily loses control of himself, suggesting that the sight of blood induces in him a love-hate amb ambivalence. Again, not dissimilar to the reaction stimulated in the alcoholic by the prospect of liquor. Dracula's strategic, as opposed to his biological interest in blood, is to take it for the purposes of ensnaring fe female victims who, in turn, will ensnare their menfolk. Here, Stoker acknowledges the folkloric requirement that vampires always seek out their nearest and dearest. The holiest love was a recruiting sergeant for their ghastly ranks. Dracula is well aware of how he can turn this to his advantage. Your girls that you all love are mine already, and through them you and others shall yet be mine, my creatures, to do my bidding and to be my jackals when I want to feed. In no instance does he destroy the lives of his victims for pleasure, but always in order to make use of them. As it is not a threat to his continued existence that prompts his quest for blood, the search must stem from a deeper psychological drive. Dracula tells an unexpected, unsuspecting Harker of his ambitions. I long to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London, to be in the midst of the whirl and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is. This confession is revealing. In the Europe of the 1890s, Dracula has become historically obsolete. Transylvania is depicted as a peasant land in decline, and fitting as the continued habitat for a proud descendant of Attila. Admittedly, it is Dracula's own no nocturnal activities over the centuries which are partly responsible for the lack of vitality and stimulation of his native land, for its depleted population are now uniformly superstitious and able to flout his authority by immunizing themselves with garlic and crosses. He feels cheated and deprived, and his hunting has been restricted to defenseless children. Moreover, there are no longer any invading Turks left for him to wage war against, 
but by coming to London, the hub of Western industrialism, thereby switching his arena and his methods of operation, he sees new opportunities to exploit as a means of self-advancement. His objective is thus to establish a contemporary vampire empire in Britain, the fulfilment of which would be unwittingly assisted by British laws and customs. The rational West will not suspect him. It is contemptuous of Eastern superstitions and will leave him free. Its democratic customs will enable him to flourish undetected and its legal prim principle of presumption of innocence will work to his devious advantage. Girls cannot hold vampires. British society will unconsciously provide both his sheath and his armour and the doubting of wise men would be his greatest strength. Notwithstanding, Dracula's motives also contain a more personal element. When narrowly escaping Amber a bush in London, he reveals his driving grievance. My revenge has just begun. I spread it over centuries and time is on my side. Revenge? Revenge for what? Stoker seems to be harking back to the life of the Black Tepes who was undoubtedly partly driven by revenge when he became ruler of Valachia, seeking to avenge the deaths of his father and brother and his own adolescent incar incarceration at the hands of the Turks. But if Count Dracula could not take revenge against the Turks, the superpower of his time, he could at least direct it against the modern superpower. Britain must pay the penalty for the crimes of the Turks. Further, Britain has come to symbolise the ingratitude and treachery of, treachery of Christian Europe, which betrayed Dracula while he was fighting the Turks in their interests. Yet even this desire for revenge is somehow not totally persuasive. It seems both incomplete and superficial. Although he is not technically immortal, since he cannot be destroyed, Dracula is like the wandering Jew, doomed to wander the earth for eternity unless his Achilles heel or heart be pierced. The Count is bored. It is sport he is after, a challenge. He is toying with his adversaries, taunting them, almost defying them to pit their puny wits against him. Despite this range of motives and grievances, it is not Stoker's aim to elicit sympathy for Dracula or reveal him a victim as much as a victimizer. Stoker portrays him as an incarnate evil without any redeeming features, someone deserving not the least vestige of sympathy. Stoker's intention was, presumably, that the reader breathes a sigh of relief when Dracula meets his eventual doom, or was it? Clearly, his pursuers think they have destroyed Dracula, and continue to think so several, several years afterwards. But have they? This is how Mina describes the climatic moment. As I looked, the eyes of Dracula saw the sinking sun, and the look of hate in them turned to triumph. But on the instant came the sweep and the flash of Jonathan's great knife. I shrieked as I saw it shear through the throat, whilst at the same moment, Mr. Morris's bowie knife plunged in the heart. The whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. In that moment of, dis of dissolution, there was in the face a look of peace such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. This might seem conclusive enough until it is remembered that earlier Van Helsing had given precise instructions on how to be rid of the vampire. Folklore, too, insists on most, almost ritualistic observation of prescribed rites. These are not followed in the case of Dracula, who is dispatched as if he were human with cold steel. No wooden stake is used, the head is not detached from the body, and there is no corpse left to be properly treated or devoured by flames. Initially, it seems that Dracula's look of triumph is premature, but could it be the attacker's sense of satisfaction that is misplaced? 
Stoker had already informed his readers that vampires have the power of dematerialization and can transform themselves into specks of dust. Conceivably, then, the Count has dematerialized just in time, and realizing his narrow escape, prefers to maintain a low profile until such time as Stoker might have chosen to resurrect him in the sequel. Thank God for good, brave men. Stoker has in the first place the, the deficiency commonly found among writers who concern themselves almost exclusively with occult themes, of having either no interest in human personality or no ability to analyze it. Despite the fact that he uses with unsurpassed skill the technique most suited to revelation of character, namely diary entries and the like, the people in the story are totally unconvincing, with the partial except exception of the demon himself, whose personality is, of course, inhuman. Glenson John bon Barclay, Anatomy of Horror, Masters of Occult Picture, Fiction, page 44. It is commonplace criticism of Gothic romances in general that they lack vividness and characterization, that their heroes and heroines are uniformly stereotyped and one-dimensional, and that this failing stems from the principal preoccupation of the genre, the threat of the supernatural. Otherworldly beings inevitably take precedence over this worldly ones. Dracula has not escaped from this line of attack. Indeed, it has received particular vituperation from certain critics. Even those otherwise well disposed towards the novel have flayed Stoker's inability or unwillingness to give greater substance and credibility to the mortals lined up against the Count. While the novel might have been improved had Stoker paid as much attention to his living beings as to his vampire, it can be contended that the book survives this blemish. It is not the case that Stoker lacked the ability to make his characters credible. One of the reasons for Dracula's established place as a horror classic is the masterly way the author paints his central creation. So omnipotent is Count Dracula, and so all-encompassing is his evil, that it is necessary for the cast of mortals to pale alongside him. When Dracula sneers at his adversaries, you think to baffle me. You, with your pale faces all in a row, like sheep in a butcher's, he is speaking for Stilker. Compared to the Count, they are like sheep, pitiful, lacking in depth, vision, and character. They must be that way. Had Stoker laboured to present them with greater vigour, the essential imbalance of the contest between good and evil would have shifted, and Dracula's omnipotence diluted. None of them are a match for him. Compared to, the cre to a creature like Dracula, they are mere putty in his hands. Only collectively, do they possess any strength, and that realization is central to the novel. 